If you've listened to The Real Wealth Show for some time, you know I often talk about the four pillars of success in real estate. The first being following job growth. The second, population growth. The third, infrastructure growth. And the fourth pillar being affordability. These are the four main things I look for when searching for real estate markets. On today's show, we're going to focus on the second pillar, population growth, and specifically demographics. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Today's guest, I've had the honor of interviewing before. He is an international respected demographer with over 25 years experience, basically counting people, and in so doing, being able to predict how their impact can affect markets, businesses, and real estate, and society in general. Ken Gronbach is the author of the best-selling book, The Age Curve, How to Profit from the Coming Demographic Storm. He also most recently wrote, Upside, profiting from the profound demographic shifts ahead. And he's here with us today to explain why some areas are doomed because of their demographics, while other areas are set to boom. So let's have some fun. Ken, welcome back to The Real Wealth Show. My pleasure, Kathy. Oh, I just love having you here because I will nerd out for the next 20 minutes because we're talking about demographics. I want to start with something you mentioned last time, which is the way that dem demographers typically look at a generation versus what has appeared over the last few years. And for example, my daughter is 25, but she's absolutely calls herself a Gen Z, not a millennial. Um, so tell me a little bit about like w what a demographer looks at in generations. Well, even demographers disagree on, on exactly what generations are, but uh, the only way you can compare generations is looking at them as 20 years long, period. It's, it's, the, it's the length of time from which when a person is born to when that person can produce another person. And that's 20 years. So we use 20 years. So does the uh, U.S. Census. When you get outside of, of using U.S. Census data in the 20-year generation uh, timing, <clears throat> you can't compare generations. Your, your daughter is a millennial. Yeah. Don't tell so, her that, though. But no, between for, you and no, me, we know it. <laughs> yeah, from my, from my perspective, yeah, because uh, Gen Z are currently zero to 19 years old. They're not fully born yet, and they won't be fully born to the end of December. Uh, Gen Y millennials are 1985 to 2004. So, and then everybody accepts boomers at uh, uh, 45 to 64. And so, so we just go in 20 year uh, increments out from the boomers and it works. It works very well. So how does it stick? You know, these, um, these random dates that, uh, is it based on technology or changes or just yes. someone randomly came up with these dates? It's subjectivity. I, and I really don't know, but there, <laughs> there are, there are people that make, um, uh, generation X and generation X was born 65 to 84. Uh, nine years long. Uh, how can you compare a nine-year generation to the baby boomers, which are 20 years long? It, it's impossible. You just, yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah. Why no, we... There's lots and lots of people that make up, and that's what <laughs> it is. It, it's fabricated in, yeah. in its opinion. So, But when you use 20-year um, generations, as the census does, you can compare and, and be very accurate. It just makes so much sense. And then John Burns, I don't know if you know him, John Burns Real Estate Investing, he uses 10-year periods because there's such a difference between a 20-year-old and a 40-year-old. Or in my case, you know, if, if you're looking at baby boomers who are 80 versus 60, it's a, there's a big difference. True. Yeah, it wouldn't be within the realm of, of what demographers think. So Yeah, maybe more something to analyze real estate and, and purchases and so forth. Uh, but I agree with you. So let's just say we're right. <laughs> okay. So moving on to just demographics, there's also been a lot of news about 
the demographic shifts after COVID. There were certainly demographic shifts before COVID. Then a lot of things really accelerated. And then I've heard that that's changing or kind of going back. Where are we today with some of the demographic shifts in the U.S.? And I and I mean in migration. Well, baby boomers are going south. And they're going south in very large numbers. I live in South Florida. I mean, you could feel the ground shake right now with the construction that's going on because they're building everywhere, all around us. Baby boomers and, and baby boomers are 60 to 79 years old, are moving south. They don't want to uh, live through winters. Okay, Generation X is, is doing the same. But Generation X is much smaller than the boomers. They just weren't the same number of them born, which is what how we compare those two. And, and for real estate, it's perfect because Generation X almost shut down real estate around 2007, 2008, because they, they simply were not starting houses at the same level that the boomers did when the boomers started houses. My, my two examples, one of them was Honda motorcycles and another one was Levi Strauss, Levi Jeans. And the Generation X essentially wiped out both of those industries because there weren't enough of them. They're, they're, they're much smaller. It's 11% difference when you compare the critical mass and peak to valley, it's about 35% difference. So a 35% free fall in your market makes you go away. <laughs> so you don't yeah. want that. But here's what's happening. We currently have, uh, and, and your audience will love this, we currently have 170 million people under 40 years old. That's a record. Now, when do people start households? Well, they used to start households late 20s. Now they start households uh, mid 30s. Why? That's Generation Y millennials. Generation Y millennials did everything late. They moved out of their parents' homes late. They threw away all those trophies they didn't deserve late. They uh, took their time getting through college late, starting households late, getting married late, having kids late. Late, late, late. That's what you're dealing with. But Right now, I think there it's pretty much a necessity of this monster generation uh, Y millennials are 88 million strong, 88 million. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of beds. That's a lot of housing. That's a lot of everything that they're going to need and they're going to consume. So it looks very good. It really does. The economy of the United States is in a good position. A good portion of, of, of uh, millennials are Latino and a bigger portion of uh, Generation Z uh, are Latinos, big portion. And we have we have about 67 million Latinos in the United States and we're not going to send them back. Yeah. Uh, so you said that baby boomers are moving to the southeast, I think. Um, what about these younger generations? Yeah, well, they're they're moving as well. Uh, they're going to where there are opportunities. Uh, Generation Y millennials are currently uh, 20 to 39. Where are they going? Well, Texas is picking up a, a, a you know a lion's share of them, but South, wherever the boomers go, there's going to be jobs, and it's going to be jobs because boomers need services and products, and boomers have about a hundred trillion dollars, hundred trillion with a T. In assets. Yeah, well, that's that's like four times our uh, GDP in the United States. W what does that mean? That means wherever they go, Generation Y millennials will follow opportunity. And where the boomers go is going to be opportunity. And that's South. Yeah, that's, that's so fascinating. It makes sense that you have this large generation of baby boomers who are now retiring and yet ha are loaded, basically, <laughs> the wealthiest people in the country. Uh, yep. Where money goes, uh, business flows. So it, it is, uh, there'll be lots of businesses around there. What kind of businesses and where specifically do you see um, this business picking up? Well, it, it's going to pick up probably Virginia South. And, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to be bad in Texas. But what happens when you know, boomers come down here, they, they either move into uh, a house or a condo or a multifamily, uh, but they mostly buy. But the boomers are going to consume everything. And plus, they're going to leave a lot of money to their kids. It'll be the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world uh, from one generation to another. And that will absolutely happen. And it will probably happen in the next 20 years. Now, uh, 
what do the boomers consume? I mean, they eat out all the time. So restaurants are going to do very, very well down here. Uh, automobiles are doing unbelievably well down here. Uh, houses, yeah. I mean, what, what? it depends on what you have to sell. Well, so the consumption levels, Kathy, are going to be very high. You have 170 million, million people under 40. That is pure consumption. And then you have boomers with a lot of money, so they're going to buy all their dreams down here. Aren't the highest spending years right around the 40s because the kids, you got the kids and you got to do the move up to a bigger house? Is, are those the big spending years? Yeah, they, they would be if the millennials did things on time. But, <laughs> yeah, and I don't know what they're going to do. I really don't. But yes, they, the, uh, the, the person that buys the most automobiles is a 43-year-old male. You know, why? Well, because they need a car and they need a car that doesn't break down and they have kids. But that was true for the boomers. We don't have good data on that for the millennials. We just mm -hmm. don't. And uh, Generation X was too small to move the needle. It, in fact, they, they almost they did not buy Generation X did not buy the same number of the highly profitable SUV vehicles as the baby boomers. And that was, you know, Detroit sh shivered. I mean, it was terrible. But they're fine now. We're we're kind of back to normal now, and and the number of new cars that are selling are, is is good. You said on the last interview was that America is strong, uh, has a strong economy, and will because we are growing. We do, we are creating babies. We're having babies, and we allow immigration. Uh, where, whereas some countries like Japan and maybe China don't so much. So is that still true even with this threat of? mass deportation, although you just kind of made a hint that maybe you don't think that's really going to happen. It was maybe just a threat. Yeah. I. Well, let me put it this way. It would be tragic if it happened because we need them. There are 67 million Latinos in the United States. Best, best thing that ever happened to the United States was Latinos. I tell my audiences, go find a Latino, kiss them on the lips and thank them for coming because without them, we can't function. We wouldn't be a country in 2050 because we wouldn't have enough labor. How do I know that? China. China employed what they call a, a one-child policy for, and, and they started in 1979 when Henry Kissinger uh, persuaded Deng Xiaoping to go to that their population was too large and growing too fast. They needed to reduce that if they wanted to be taken seriously by the Western world. So they did it. The problem is now under 40 years old, they are missing a half billion people. So what, what don't they have right now? Labor. What do you need to run an industrial nation? Labor. China is the world's manufacturer now. I mean, they manufacture between 30 to 40% of everything that's made in the world. Can they keep that up? No, they cannot keep that up because they don't have labor. So what happens in the United States? In the United States, we have the 170 million people under 40 years old. Do we have labor? Yes. Is a lot of that labor uh, people of color uh, in La Latinos. Yes, absolutely positively. The worst thing that we could have happen, and this is a possibility, is Mexico is blossoming. Mexico is picking up manufacturing from China. It's called reshoring. It's coming back to China with a lot of uh, Chinese investors. They're, they're setting up their plants in Mexico. Mexico has perfect demography. They have just the right amount of everybody and they have labor and it's about the same price as the labor in China, which is between five and $10 an hour, which is like the zip. So what's going to happen is our Latinos, especially our Mexicans are going to want to go back and we're going to regret that big time. Now, if a lot of these factories are moving to Mexico, but there would be tariffs. Is there a plan to, I mean, I know that this has been talked about a lot, but what if there's tariffs from Mexico to the U.S., would then it be so desirable? It's fine. What, here's what happens. Prosperity wipes out uh, uh, crime. It, it, when you have enough money to, to invest in your um, law enforcement, crime goes away. Right now, Mexico does not have that, so they're run by cartels. Are the cartels the future of Mexico? No, can't be. When Mexico reaches a prosperity level necessary where they can
do law enforcement at the proper level, the cartels are going to go away, period. Do we have cartels in the United States? Yeah, probably some, but not, not at that level. We're prosperous. Poverty breeds crime, not, not prosperity. They're going to be fine. What I mean is, do you think that there would be tariffs in the U.S. so that companies would be less incentivized to move to Mexico and instead bring their factories to the U.S.? My theory is this, Kathy. Uh, you have the largest manufacturer in the world, China, doesn't have labor. And guess who else doesn't have labor? Southeast Asia and uh, essentially all of the Asian countries, including uh, now South Korea. South Korea just stopped having kids. You don't have kids. You don't have, you don't have anybody. Kids are people, and they grow up, and they have a they have a, a fertility less than one. They have less than one child per couple, less, which is amazing. So what is going to happen? The world is going to need stuff. Where is it going to be made? It's going to be made. In the Americas, it's going to be made in Canada, United States, Mexico, Central and South America, where we have labor and we have resources. The United States has wealth. So our uh, the, the amount of manufacturing that's going to come back to the United States is going to be huge, overwhelming and wonderful. And we can do it. I just spoke in uh, Connecticut and I spoke to probably over a thousand small business manufacturers, which, which is what Connecticut is, specializes in. And I told them that, and they're ready. They are ready and they're seeing it happen already because they're, they're getting uh, a, stuff that was made in China, they are currently making. And it's, it's you're gonna see that throughout the United States. They have to be careful though. They really have to hang on to their labor. <laughs> In the U.S., our population growth is starting to slow down, though, right? Or at least babies. I, I thought just it just made sense to me that if the millennials are such a huge population that there would actually be a baby boom because of that generation. That's been my thought. But that doesn't seem to be what the data is saying. No, no. It's a shame. No, we're about at one six now. So, and that's not one six is OK. It's not good. One, one point six uh, babies per Per, per uh, couple. Couple, okay. Yeah. And can we st can we improve on that? Well, one, one of the things, what is keeping our uh, fertility up is Latinos. They have kids. Um, if they stop having kids, we do have a problem. But we have enough population that's already on, that's already done. They've already, they're on the planet and, and they're in the United States that we are going to see a replication of what happened in China with the one child policy. And that is our labor is going to double. Why? Because men and women both can work. You only have one child, you give it to the, the in-laws and, and uh, you both go to work. So we're gonna have Boku labor. When China did that, their uh, GDP uh, spiked over that 40 years. But they went from pre-industrial to post-industrial in 40 years, which was a record because they ran out of labor. We're not gonna run out of labor. So for the next 40 years, you're gonna see prosperity in the United States at a level we don't understand. Wow. All right, then let's talk about housing because that's what our, our audience wants to hear about. Uh, I, I had always predicted in my um, very um, unsophisticated way that 2020 to 2024 would be a housing boom because of the age of the millennials um, coming into first time home buyer age, at least the largest group of them. Um, now we are, you know, moving into 2025. It, it, do you see this housing boom continuing? Yes. Why? In fact, it, it, because it's late because of the size of the population. You know, they're not living with their parents anymore and they're not living in the basement, but they came out of that basement late, really. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you have 88 million of them. Where are they going to live in their cars? No, we're going, we might need to rethink housing. We might need to rethink what housing looks like. You know, I, I spoke recently to um, houses that were uh, fabricated, you know, they build them in pieces and they're doing incredible. They're doing wonderful. 
And I said, you, you, you're going to probably for the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years because of the size of this new generation and because those houses are cheap, you know, so, but we're fine. Mm-hmm. Kathy, okay. stop worrying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I take it. I have a lot of responsibility because we do have over 77,000 members at Real Wealth and many of these people, you know, many of our members listen to these types of interviews to make decisions. You know, you don't want to be stuck with a big portfolio of housing when it's no longer needed. Right. Um, Are there any parts of the country where that's true, where people are leaving and there's going to be a glut of housing? Yeah, probably in the Northeast. Northeast. Why is that? Yeah. Well, like New England, New England is losing population. People are moving south. There are certain areas that are growing. We just did research for uh, regional auto service where people, you you call up and they come and they fix your flat type thing. And uh, they're huge. The boomers are leaving the the Northeast and they're leaving uh, South and North Dakota and they're leaving that area and moving to where it's warm. And it seems like the millennials are following them, which would, which would make sense. Okay, so I'm going to bring up a touchy subject. Last time you were on, you said uh, because there's such a large generation of people under the age of 40 and um, and then the, the new Gen Z voters coming in that we would probably see um, the country sway more blue, more liberal because of so many young people. I actually got some one-star reviews from that. People saying, you're wrong, you're wrong. Turns out you might have been wrong on this one. All right. So what happened? I don't know. I, I, I really, well, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, 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 you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a prophet and I don't make, get everything right. I really don't. I mean, I get a lot of things right, but uh, I thought that the liberals, the progressives would have won the election, would have won the presidency. They did not. And it is mysterious to me to see which way the Latinos went. I, I, I don't get it. That, that's an analysis that's that's staring me in the face, and I have to figure that out. I don't know why. I really did not think that the Republicans would have appealed to them or appealed to uh, the young people, and and uh, but they did. So some research needed needed there. Yeah, I yeah. I, I apologize. I, I know I've told a lot of people that the liberals were going to win. And they, yes, we would be a liberal nation. But I'll tell you this, it's an undercurrent now. The whole, you know, woke thing, you know, not caring, uh, you know, not doing what you do because solely for money, but doing things to be a, a better citizen as a business. You know, the whole Bomba socks thing, you know, one for every pair they sell, they give a pair to a homeless shelter. And, uh, there are supermarket chains now that are feeding people with the food they throw away. So it's we're going to see a different place. We're going to see a kinder, gentler United States, unless I'm completely wrong. And I'm wondering if I if I am completely wrong, especially after this election. <laughs> OK, but I like it. Let's let's hold that thought. A kinder, more generous country. Yes. Yeah. And peaceful. Okay. Well, any last words of advice for our listeners? <laughs> Don't suffer from anxiety and change because you're going to see a lot of change, big change. Uh, I, President Trump is, uh, uh, he is, is very opinionated, has, you know, has positions on things. I don't think he fully is going to uh, be able to realize all of his ambitions because I don't think the American people are going to let him. But we're in for change. And change, for the most part, generally is good when we change and and morph into what we should be. And we'll see. We'll see where that goes. We all know that we are moving into a time of great change with just, just looking at AI and technology and what, what, where, how far we've come in just 10 years, 15 years. I mean, think about 15 years ago, we didn't even have Uber or, or Airbnb. And how has that changed the landscape for real estate investors? And so for, there's a lot more coming. So you, I you tell that. your real estate investors, stay with it. Don't be afraid. The demand is huge. I can't tell you if it's going to come tomorrow or five years from now. But there's unless people are going to live in tents, they're fine. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, Ken. Well, thank you again for uh, being here on The Real Wall Show. I, I appreciate it every time. I appreciate it, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to build your real estate team in some of these fastest growing markets of the U.S., just go to realwealthshow.com. It's free to join. And once you're there, you'll get a breakdown of all the different areas where Real Wealth has teams that we've worked with for over 10 years that have helped our members find properties and they offer property management for a turnkey investment. If you're not sure what you want to do, you can speak with one of our investment counselors. Again, it's free to get counseling from them to help you on your journey of building real wealth. Again, just go to realwealthshow.com. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.